Music is one of those mysteries and little miracles in life, isn't it? It has the power to stimulate our brains or put us in a certain mood. If you close your eyes, it can take you back to a moment in time or a memory. I could literally close my eyes right now and think about Depeche Mode's People Are People and I can almost smell the air or feel the breeze of Newport Beach at 32nd Street trying to park my little VW bug somewhere near the sand with my friends. It's amazing. You're about to watch an incredible conversation between Dan Reynolds and I. I say conversation because this is more than an interview, it really is a very personal talk. And I'm so lucky to have had it. Dan shares some really incredible stuff about his music, relationships, some of the dark times he's been through and how he got out of it, as well as some other important issues. I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did. In any case, this is a great reminder for all of us that Whoever you are, wherever you are, we were born for greatness. That we all have gifts to share in art. Quoting from one of my favorites, we are the music makers. We are the dreamers of dreams. Hello, I am Dan Reynolds. I sing for Imagine Dragons, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Brand. Dan, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. I mean, your music seems like some other artists, but also uniquely different, extremely personal, that you're writing from personal experience and then you're pouring it out onto a page. How much of that do you think, would you put a label on that and say that's inspiration? You know, I don't, I don't really know what it is other than uh, just truth. And for me, truth has is, is not always been a part of my art. <clears throat> it's, I mean, it's always been there, but I, I would bury it in metaphors because I was very fearful when I started art that I never wanted to write a song and had, have anybody know what I was actually talking about. Like when I was 12 years old, especially, you know, I, I remember showing my music to the first time to my dad, I think was the first person I showed a song to. And I, and I was starting to deal with depression for the first time. And I didn't want my dad to say, what's wrong with my son? Is my son gonna hurt himself? He's depressed and he needs to see a therapist. Like, I didn't wanna have that conversation. But I didn't want to write about anything else about, other than being sad. You know? So I would write these songs that were highly metaphorical. Right. that me I'm sure my dad probably did know yeah you know um, but and that that went into our career so a lot of the first songs that I ever wrote whether it was radioactive or a lot of people listen to these songs they think it's about a post-apocalyptic thing or I've heard people say that it was like about spider-man like all kinds of crazy <laughs> things but that song was me really depressed writing about depression yeah and and welcoming to myself to a new age of enlightenment and happiness which is always what I've tried to do since I was young which is to kind of reach somewhere that I can't which is out of a clouded mind of depression. Yeah. So. How early on, what's, what's the level of self-awareness that you had? How early were you kind of keyed in that you were depressed? Um, because, you know, speaking personally, I didn't really think depression was a thing until later on in my life when it really punched me right in the face. And right. I was like, oh, I, th I think I'm depressed. Right. <laughs> it's almost like that idea of, my eyes are leaking, what's happening? I mean, you're crying for the first time, you know, you're just not self-aware. How early were you? Did you I didn't out? have a name for it uh, in my teenage years, but I knew that I was different than the kids around me. I wasn't like, um, I, I was just different. And I didn't quite know what it was. Uh, when I got into high school, I certainly started to know that I was, okay, this is depression. It's not sad. Anybody who's been depressed knows that it's not. You know, there's a big difference between, hey, I'm sad, my girlfriend broke up with me. I'm, I'm heartbroken, I'm sad. And depression. Depression, I mean, that could maybe trigger someone into a depression, and that's right. another conversation. But for me, what depression was, is there was no real reason that I could point to. Right. But I was, lo I lost interest in everything that I usually used to like. I became very antisocial. I didn't want to go out. Uh, and felt like numb. Like people would talk to me, and it would just go in one ear and out the other. And I was mm -hmm. giving the minimal effort to get out of every conversation. You start to detach. Yeah. Yeah. And isolate. Yep. Yeah, and it's ironic, right? Because that's the absolute opposite of what you need at that given right. time, right? You need to connect. You need help. I'm glad that you're outspoken about mental health. I think, of course, in the last decade, I guess, there's been a lot more talk about it, a lot more acceptance, but I still think there's still such a stigma. We were talking off camera about my wife's brothers in the military, you know, the military and, you know, depression or any kind of... Uh, circumstance of the heart or the mind, it's off limits, right? They, 
a lot of people look at it as a as a weakness. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, like you touched on, I, I really believe that we do live in a, in a world that it is highly stigmatized to be vulnerable, and more so to actually uh, admit fault. Like, yeah. we live in this social media world where everybody's sharing all these really picturesque moments and perfect things, and everybody looks beautiful, and there's filters if you, to make yourself feel more beautiful, and there's all these things, and there's there's not enough of hey, I'm hurting, and without people saying, oh, you're looking for attention. Because it's social media, again, everything feels like it's just attention-driven. Right. Where a lot of these things are real. Someone is hurting. Someone needs something. But instead of maybe saying it to their friend, they're saying it online, and then they're becoming, you know, people are making fun of them or thinking they're seeking attention or whatever. So it's, it's really dangerous. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm self-aware of who I am and, and how I'm perceived because I've been in this industry for so long. And most people I meet say exactly kind of what you said, which is like, oh, here's this guy who's like, you look like a football player, you look, you know, tall, your hands and privileged. Like I've been, I've been incredibly privileged. I've, I've had a privileged life. I know what people think when they see me typically because I'm just like everyone else who knows what people, you know, you, 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 you see these things. So, yeah. although you did not come in leather pants or anything like the right, but it, right, but Sorry. right, but but with that said, like I feel like a great amount of responsibility to show my brokenness yeah. because of that. Um, because I've, since I was young, I've hated how I looked. I, I've, I hated who, uh, a lot of parts of me. I dealt with a lot of self-hatred. Um, and so because of that, I, I feel a responsibility to share my truth be because of this um, platform I've been given. I'm on a stage in front of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people a year. So, you know, when we're touring and, and re so for me, it's like, uh, I don't know, I feel like if I'm, I'm gonna die at some point and I'm here for this allotted amount of time, so what am I gonna do with this amount of time? <clears throat> I just wanna speak my truth. Yeah. I, I wanna share my truth with people and my truth is that life is really hard. I've dealt with a lot of depression and self-hatred. Um, but I believe that therapy has saved my life. I believe that music has saved my life. So I think it's the most important for someone who is perceived as um, given, you know, been privileged, and I, and I, I am privileged, yeah. but to, to really speak out. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like I, I'm very aware of the perception of who I am. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, 